Almost on a daily basis, we hear in the news of another incident where God, Christ, the Bible are being stripped out of American civilization. This has been going on for perhaps half a century. And the, and the key expression that you hear constantly, separation of church and state. Why can we no longer have Christmas vacation in the public schools? Instead, winter holidays? Well, because we can't have any, any reference to religion, or at least Christianity, in our public schools. And so it's being stripped out of our public schools, it's being stripped out of our government, and it's being stripped out of public life. Separation of church and state. Almost to the point where it's unquestioned. Rank-and-file Americans believe that's a correct political doctrine. Where did this notion of separation of church and state come from? Well, interestingly enough, in 1947, a U.S. Supreme Court case, Everson versus the Board of Education, a case in which the High Court declared that the First Amendment has erected a wall between church and state. They said that wall must be kept high and impregnable. And they even made this statement, we could not approve of the slightest breach. Well, where did that court get that idea? Where did this notion of separation of church and state come from? Did it come from the Constitution? No, the phrase separation of church and state is not found in the Constitution. Uh, did it come from some other uh, organic utterance by the founders and framers? Maybe it's uh, in the Declaration or some other public document? No, it's not found in any of the organic utterances of those who framed the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. Interesting, the late U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice, William Rehnquist, on one occasion made this point. The phrase, separation of church and state, is a misleading metaphor. It ought to be promptly abandoned. It does not represent constitutional law. And yet, here it dominates the American landscape. It dominates the uh, system of jurisprudence that uh, is operative in our nation. How, how, could, this not, how could this not be uh, a significant and important and crucial and legitimate concept? Interestingly enough, the phrase, separation of church and state, which was quoted by the U.S. Supreme Court in 1947, actually harks back to a private letter that was written, in fact it was dated January 1st, 1802, written by then U.S. President Thomas Jefferson. Now we're talking a quarter of a century after the commencement of the founding of our country and the Declaration of Independence. But well, why was he writing a, a private piece of correspondence? Well, he had received a letter. And he was responding to those who wrote in that letter. Those who wrote in the letter were representatives of the Danbury Baptists Association. And if you read the letter that they wrote, while complimenting Thomas Jefferson, commending him, congratulating him on having ascended to what could arguably be considered the highest political office in the land, the U.S. president, they nevertheless expressed in that letter concern. Because you see Thomas Jefferson among the founders. Thomas Jefferson, along with a handful of others, would be considered the least religious among the founders. Uh, there were questions about Jefferson's uh, commitment to Christianity specifically and his views about the deity of Christ. So they were concerned that perhaps now that he was in the highest executive office of the land, that he might in some form or fashion interfere with their perceived right to pursue Christianity according to their own interpretations. Well, Thomas Jefferson wrote back to these individuals and notice in that response to these Baptists, among other things, Jefferson made this statement, believing with you 
that religion is a matter which lies between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith or his worship, that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions, I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should, notice, quote, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. There's a direct reference to the First Amendment of the Constitution. Thus building a wall of separation between church and state. There's the letter that Jefferson wrote in which he uses the expression wall of separation between church and state. Question, what did he mean by that? When he said there was a wall of separation erected, notice, by the First Amendment, what did he mean by that? Did he mean we have got to keep God, the Bible, and Christianity out of public life? We've got to keep it out of the government, out of the schools. That's what many individuals believe he meant. Or did he mean by that we need to keep the federal government from interfering with the public practice of Christianity? You know, those are two very different views. How do, how do we decide what was meant by that and whether or not the current popular interpretation is in fact accurate? Well, first of all, let's take a look at the First Amendment. The first of ten amendments that are considered to be the Bill of Rights. Here are the first ten amendments to the U.S. Constitution which were framed shortly after the founders framed the Constitution because of concerns that the federal government might interfere with certain foundational inalienable rights that had been bestowed upon Americans by God Himself. Now you're familiar with the First Amendment. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Here is what the founders meant by these two expressions. They're called clauses in current jurisprudence. There's the Establishment Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. What did they mean by that? They meant no one Protestant denomination is to be established as the state religion, nor prohibiting the free exercise thereof. What did they mean by that? They meant the federal government is not to do anything that would interfere with the free and public practice of the Christian religion. Well, is that in fact what they meant? As I claim, that's a rather bold claim to say that that's what they meant by that. Well, let's call forth the evidence and see. The historical evidence, let it speak for itself, rather than allow ourselves to be influenced by popular conceptions. One of the founders of our civilization, who has gone down in history, as a matter of fact, as the father of the Bill of Rights. Now, here's a man that I would think knew exactly what the founders intended in their wording of the First Amendment freedom of religion. George Mason. He was a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. And as these uh, delegates proposed various wordings, they were trying to hone in and get the point across that they pretty much all agreed needed to be gotten across. The problem was how to word it so that future generations, future courts, future judges would not misapprehend their words, twist their words, distort their ideas, and walk away with some other notion. So they were very concerned about how it was to be worded. Well, here's what George Mason proposed. Here's how he thought the First Amendment should be worded. All men have an equal, natural, and unalienable right to the free exercise of religion, according to the dictates of conscience, and that no particular sect or society of Christians ought to be favored or established by law in preference to others. 
Well, George Mason's proposed wording did not make the final cut, but it nevertheless proves the historical context in which the discussion of the wording of the First Amendment was taking place. They were talking about concern over which Christian group might gain control of the government in such a way that they could oppress other Christian sects. So Thomas Jefferson was saying that according to the Constitution and the First Amendment, no power was being imparted to the, cons to the Congress in order for them to establish a national church. The Congress was not being given any power to compel by law any particular worship rituals of any particular denomination. That's the wall that Jefferson was referring to. There's so much historical evidence to show that that is the case. Do you know that within two days after Jefferson wrote that wall of separation metaphor in that private letter? He attended church services which were held in the House of Representatives where the, the uh, speaker, the U.S. Speaker's podium served as the pulpit of the service. You see, today's interpretation of separation of church and state would say, oh, you know, a president can't go and attend a church like that and, and, uh, whenever the church, uh, the assembly is occurring in a government building. That violates separation of church. The man who wrote that phrase obviously didn't feel that it did. And in fact, he continually attended church services uh, held on government property, government buildings, during both of his terms as president. President Madison attended uh, church services in the U.S. House on Sundays. Our sixth president, uh, John Quincy Adams, uh, used the treasury building as the church assembly uh, for Sundays when he would attend those services. Here's further evidence. Jefferson wrote in his second inaugural address, which he delivered in 1805 for the beginning of his second term. In that inaugural speech, you can go online, Google it, read it for yourself. He explained the role of the Constitution concerning religious matters. Listen carefully to what he said. In matters of religion, I have considered that its free exercise is placed by the Constitution independent of the powers of the general government. By general, he means federal, not state or local. I have therefore undertaken on no occasion to prescribe the religious exercises suited to it, but have left them, as the Constitution found them, under the direction and discipline of state or church authorities acknowledged by the several religious societies. Notice what he was saying. The extent to which religion is to permeate your local uh, area, your local community, that's going to be determined by those local people in their state governments. The federal government, the general government, is to stay out of that. They're not to interfere with it or dictate in any way. Well, does that mean that Jefferson thought that uh, all references to God and Bible religion should be avoided even by the federal government and politicians? Is that what we're to get from that inaugural statement? Absolutely not, because all you have to do is read down further in that inaugural speech, and he closes it out with these words. I shall need to the favor of that being in whose hands we are, who led our forefathers as Israel of old from their native land and planted them in a country flowing with all the necessaries and comforts of life. Stop right there and think about that. Here is Thomas Jefferson in his second inaugural speech as president saying to the entire nation, he's delivering a political speech from the position of the federal government, and he's saying, I need the same God to show His favor to me in the same way that He showed His favor to our forefathers. He's there clearly referring there primarily to the pilgrims. And this is the same God that showed His favor to the Israelites back in the Old Testament when they left Egypt and went to the promised land. He's tied all of that together, same God, and he's referring to it in a public speech. That was not a violation of separation of church and state by the very man who used the expression. He even went so far in continuing in this inaugural speech. He said, you know, this is the God who's covered our infancy with His providence and our riper years with His wisdom. Notice, 
If you use the term deism to refer to Jefferson, you're going to have to define it in such a way that he understood the God of the Bible to be the one who was operating in the universe and interfering with, that is, he was guiding and, and participating in the establishment of our country. He said, this is the God that's covered our infancy with His providence, our riper years with His wisdom and power, to whose goodness I ask you to join with me in supplications that He will so enlighten the minds of your servants, guide their counsels, uh, prosper their measures, that whatever they do will result in your good and will secure to you the peace, friendship, and approbation of all nations. Thomas Jefferson did not believe in separation of church and state as it is being defined today. And the First Amendment does not ban Congress from recognizing or participating in religious practices. Anybody that comes away with that conclusion has misunderstood the Constitution. First Amendment only prohibits Congress from creating by law a religious establishment, that is, a state church, and requiring citizens to adhere to that. So, uh, religious symbols in schools or on public property, you know, setting up the Ten Commandments at the Capitol building or putting them on the wall of a classroom, that is not a violation of the First Amendment according to the founders themselves. Again, the First Amendment was designed to keep the government from establishing a religion and declaring by law that it is the only religion that can be worshipped. It has nothing to do with acknowledging religion and its teachings. Specifically Christianity, you say, but wait, if, if you allow the Bible, if you allow allusions to Christianity in our public schools and in our government and in our public life, well, don't you then need to give equal time to Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam? And what about the atheists, the people that are irreligious, that have no religion? Don't, don't they have a right to have their view represented as well? Well, listen to what the founders said on this matter. Their attitude was that the general doctrines of the Christian religion are the basis, the foundation, the platform on which the American Republic was poised and built. This is in fact endemic to American culture and the American way of life. Going back before the founders, the people who came to this country and were the forefathers of the founders, they saw Christianity as the essence of life. So. Our founders said Christianity has got to remain the foundation of our society or the freedom that we have known will dissolve. Well, can other religions be allowed in our country? Yes. They would have used the word tolerated. But if the majority of our population abandons Christianity, if we allow other religions to increase their presence and their role in American life, America will gradually become what the other nations of the world are. Think through that. This is a simple concept. This is not rocket science. If you want to know what America would look like, if we just throw open all of our institutions, throw open our public schools and say, Islam, come on in here. We want to give you equal time. We want to allow Islam to exert just as much influence over the nation as Christianity or any other ideology. Well, what will result from that? Well, that's not hard to answer. Look at any Islamic nation on earth. Is that what you want America to become? The same goes for Buddhism, Hinduism, atheism as well as all socialist countries. You know, socialism is the popular thing now in our country. And it's making incredible encroachments across our civilization. And most Americans apparently are good with that. What's the problem? Government ought to provide me with all these services. You better stop and think. There are many socialist countries on the earth down in South America. What about Cuba? Go down to Cuba. I challenge you to go get an air ticket, go to Cuba and stay there for a week or two, and determine whether you want America to become a socialist country. Look at any country on the planet that is dominated by any ideology that is opposed and contrary to Christianity and the principles of our republic. And you'll see very quickly what America is going to be turned into when you buy into this notion of celebrating diversity. 
Let's go back to this notion of separation of church and state. If you were to go online and look at the congressional records from the very beginning, in fact, go and look at the discussions that occurred from June 7th to September 25th, 1789. The congressional records, they're online. You can look for yourself with your own eyes. They record the months of discussions and debates of the 90 founding fathers who ended up framing the wording of the First Amendment. Guess what? Thomas Jefferson was not among those 90 who framed the First Amendment. He, he didn't participate in that discussion. And what's more, during those debates, not one of the 90 framers ever mentioned the phrase separation of church and state. You know, if that was their intent, surely at least one of the 90 that were involved in framing the First Amendment would have mentioned that phrase. But they did not. Let me call your attention to a couple quintessential founding fathers and help you to see where these men were coming from. Take, for example, James Madison. James Madison graduated from Princeton. Uh, he served as a delegate to the State Constitutional Convention. He served in the Continental Congress. He ended up being a signer of the U.S. Constitution. He co-authored the uh, famous Federalist Papers. Uh, he served in the U.S. House. Uh, he was one of the framers that uh, helped frame the Bill of Rights. Uh, he served as the Secretary of State under Thomas Jefferson and then himself served as U.S. President for two terms. Looking at the images of the discussions of the U.S. House at the time of the framing of the First Amendment, the discussions that they were having in which they were trying to sort out how to word the First Amendment. Look at this, August 15th, it happened to be on a Saturday. Notice our government worked on Saturday then, but not on Sunday. August 15th, 1789, the House went into a Committee of the Whole on the proposed amendments to the Constitution. Mr. Elias Boudinot was the president of the Congress at the time. Uh, they were talking about the wording which they were discussing whether to insert uh, between two paragraphs, and here was the wording, No religion shall be established by law, nor shall the equal rights of conscience be infringed. Mr. Sylvester had some doubts about the propriety of the mode of expression used in this paragraph. So he, his thoughts were that it was liable to a construction different from what had been made by the committee. Listen to this carefully. He feared it might be thought to have a tendency to abolish religion altogether. Is that not prophetic? That's exactly what's happened. Most of the courts these days interpret the First Amendment to mean, you know what, we've got to abolish religion so far as it being allowed to surface or express itself in any federal setting. In the federal government, well, they would say all government, state government, local government. Uh, we can't have it in government schools, public schools, so forth. Well, here they are having a discussion about the wording of the First Amendment, and they're saying, look, we've got to be careful how we word this, lest future generations get the idea that we're trying to keep religion out of our government. A view which they would have considered to be preposterous. Let us continue reading and listening to these men discuss the wording of the First Amendment. Mr. Vining suggested the propriety of transposing the two members of the Senate. Mr. Jerry said it would, it would read better if it was that no religious doctrine shall be established by law. Mr. Sherman thought the amendment altogether unnecessary inasmuch as Congress had no authority whatever de delegated to them by the Constitution to make religious establishments. He would therefore move that, that it be struck out. So Sherman thought we don't even have to have, have a First Amendment about freedom of religion because the government's not supposed to tamper with it or try to set up a, an established religion. Then Mr. Carroll spoke up. As the rights of conscience are in their nature of peculiar delicacy and will little bear the gentlest touch of governmental hand, as many sects have concurred in opinion that they are not well secured under the present Constitution, he said... He was much in favor of adopting the words. Notice what he's saying is, we don't have enough in the Constitution protecting religion, making certain that the Christian religion is allowed to be practiced. He thought it would tend more towards conciliating the minds of the people to the government than almost any other amendment he had heard proposed. 
He wouldn't contend with gentlemen about the phraseology. His object was to secure the substance in such a manner as to satisfy the wishes of the honest part of the community. So what he was saying, we got to make sure that our religious rights are secured by the Constitution. Now notice, James Madison steps forward. He apprehended the meaning of the words to be, Congress should not establish a religion and enforce the legal observation of it by law, nor compel men to worship God in any manner contrary to their conscience. There is the essence and gist of this amendment. Whether the words are necessary or not, he did not mean to say, but they had been required by some of the state conventions who seemed to entertain an opinion that under the clause of the Constitution, which gave power to Congress to make all laws necessary and proper to carry into execution the Constitution and the laws made under it, enable them to make laws of such a nature as might infringe the rights of conscience and establish a national religion. To prevent these effects, he presumed the amendment was intended, and he thought it as well expressed as the nature of the language would admit. Notice then what James Madison was saying. He was saying, look, the purpose of the First Amendment is to keep the federal government from establishing a state religion. Now, we have worded it in such a way that it will accomplish that objective. Then notice, at this point, Mr. Um, Huntington stepped forward. Uh, Samuel Huntington went on to be the governor of his home state of Connecticut. He said that he feared with the gentleman first up on this subject, referring back to Mr. Sylvester, that the words might be taken in such latitude as to be extremely hurtful to the cause of religion. I'm telling you, they're talking about Christianity. He understood the amendment to mean what had been expressed by the gentleman from Virginia. But others might find it convenient to put another construction upon it. They might misconstrue it and say, well, you know, no religion, so we need to keep religion completely out of the government. That's the point he's making. And so he said, they may misunderstand and think that, that uh, religion is not to be entertained at all when all we're trying to do is keep the federal government from setting up a government or state religion. Now, as you move down through this discussion, they comment, look at the last uh, sentence or so of the next paragraph, speaking of the charter of Rhode, Rhode Island. No religion could be established by law, but he said he hoped, therefore, that the amendment would be made in such a way as to secure the rights of conscience and a free exercise of the rights of religion, but not to patronize those who professed no religion at all. Isn't that incredible? Here are the founders saying, we sure don't want to leave the impression that the irreligious are being protected. I mean, we're not going to persecute them, but we're not trying to make a, a, an amendment here that would allow the atheists to feel comfortable. Notice James Madison spoke up again. He said, well, if the word national was inserted before religion, that ought to satisfy the minds of honorable gentlemen. He believed that the people feared one sect, notice that, He's talking about one Christian sect, one denomination, might obtain a preeminence or two combined together and establish a religion to which they would compel others to conform. He thought if the word national was introduced, it would point the amendment directly to the object it was intended to prevent. Mr. Livermore spoke up, not satisfied with that amendment, but he didn't wish them to dwell long on the subject. He thought it would be better if it was altered and made to read in this manner. Congress shall make no laws touching religion or infringing the rights of conscience. Notice Mr. Jerry comes back and says, I don't think the term national is going to, going to work because we, we currently have a discussion going on between what we might call those who are for or against a national government and those who are for or against a federal government. So they were making a distinction between national and federal. Notice in the next paragraph, James Madison speaks up again. He withdraws his motion, but makes this statement that the words, no national religion shall be established by law, did not imply that the government was a national one. And then they ended their discussion on that day on that subject with 31 for and 20 against. Notice then, let's draw a conclusion from that day's discussion of the wording of the First Amendment. 
their discussion of the wording of the First Amendment was not about religion versus irreligion, nor were they discussing Christians versus Muslims, Buddhists, and Hindus. No. The founders never placed themselves in that kind of a juxtaposition, nor were they concerned about accommodating or appeasing irreligion, secularism, or atheism. They thought that a person who's an atheist, you know, that's a person who's mentally defective. We're not contemplating that. Again, we're, we're not going to persecute them, but we're not going to set up our country to try in some way to accommodate that. The context of their discussions pertained to their deep concern that the federal government not be allowed in any way to interfere with their respective Christian denominational beliefs and practices. I ask you, isn't that exactly what has happened? We're having Bibles, we've, we have the Bible and prayer out of the public schools. We're having religious symbols all over our country uh, washed out of our civilization. Almost every day there's another attack upon some religious feature of our civilization, all under the guise of separation of church and state. Talk about a major myth being perpetrated upon our civilization. James Madison is somebody we'd better listen to. He was there and part of the framing. I'll tell you another quintessential founder we ought to listen to, Joseph Story. Joseph Story was the son of one of the men who was at the Boston Tea Party. He was one of the Indians at the Boston Tea Party in 1773. He himself graduated second in his class from Harvard. He went on to become uh, the speaker of uh, the Massachusetts legislature. He served in the uh, U.S. House of Representatives. He was then appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court by President James Madison and unbelievably served on the high court for 34 years. He's considered the founder of the Harvard Law School. In fact, he is only one of two founders of our country that bear the title Father of American Jurisprudence. I guess he would know what is meant by the First Amendment and whether or not this notion of separation of church and state means we got to get Christianity and religion out of the government. Mr. Story wrote a monumental, in fact the first comprehensive treatise on the provisions of the U.S. Constitution. He was there. He was part of this process. And his commentaries on the Constitution of the United States are essentially a cornerstone of early American jurisprudence. Let me call your attention to some of his comments on this matter. And I realize this is somewhat tedious, but to, to answer this question about separation of church and state and to nail it down, to, to cinch a proper understanding, you've got to go back and spend a little effort, a little mental uh, energy, and look at what these men said on the matter. And it suddenly clears up and becomes crystal clear. Look what he said, for example, in this monumental series, specifically Book 3, and here is uh, paragraph 1867. Now there will probably be found few persons in this or any other Christian country. Notice that. <laughs> He's acknowledging right up front. This is a Christian country who would deliberately contend that it was unreasonable or unjust to foster and encourage the Christian religion generally as a matter of sound policy as well as of revealed truth. He said there would be few persons who would think that we shouldn't do that. Well, we've got a lot of them in our country now. He says, in fact, every American colony from its foundation down to the revolution, with the exception of Rhode Island, if indeed that state be an exception, did openly by the whole course of its laws and institutions support and sustain in some form the Christian religion and almost invariably gave a peculiar sanction to some of its fundamental doctrines. And this has continued to be the case in some of the states down to the present period with, now listen to this carefully, without the slightest suspicion that it was against the principles of public law or republican liberty. The early founders never believed that promoting Christianity in the general sense would in any way interfere with, with our country and our liberty. 
He said, indeed, in a republic, there would seem to be a peculiar propriety in viewing the Christian religion as the great basis on which it must rest for its support and permanence, if it be what it has ever uh, been deemed by its truest friends to be, the religion of liberty. Let's pause there for just a moment and uh, ask this question. If you were to go to any other country on earth, go to an Islamic country, go to a Hindu country, go to a Buddhist country, go to an atheistic country, go to a socialist country, are those countries free in the sense that Americans have enjoyed freedom? Absolutely not. Well then, those ideologies and those philosophies and those religions are not friends to the liberty and freedom that we have enjoyed in this country. Well, what religion is a true friend to the kind of country that we have enjoyed all the Christianity? Christianity. The founders knew that. They articulated it frequently over and over. And for anyone today to take the notion of separation of church and state to mean we've got we've to get Christianity out of here, they would be horrified and they would be angry at such a misrepresentation. Look what else uh, Joseph Story had to say on this extremely critical issue and this very uh, important matter. As you move down through his discussion, I, I encourage you to go online and get this for yourself and, let, and you read it and study it. We don't have time to look at it in great detail. But he makes the point that um, you know people can't be happy. Civil government cannot be preserved without piety, religion, and morality. And uh, these have to be promoted. They have to be encouraged without interfering with anybody's own personal doctrinal uh, viewpoint. In paragraph 1868, listen carefully probably at the time of the adoption of the Constitution and of the amendment to it now under consideration. He's talking about the First Amendment. The general, if not the universal sentiment in America was that Christianity ought to receive encouragement from the state so far as was not incompatible with the private rights of conscience and the freedom of religious worship. Now notice what he's saying there. Should Christianity be encouraged in our society by the government? Absolutely. But don't interfere with anybody's interpretation of Scripture, their own right to conscience. Don't interfere with uh, their freedom of worship. If they want to go to worship on Sunday and worship a certain way, the government's not to interfere with that. Now notice this unbelievable statement. An attempt to level all religions, that's exactly what's happening in our country today, under the guise of separation of church and state an attempt to level all religions and to make it a matter of state policy to hold all in utter indifference would have created universal disapprobation, that is disapproval, if not universal indignation. Let's pause just a moment and comment on that statement as well. He is saying, that at the very beginning of our country and at the framing of the Constitution and the framing of the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, freedom of religion, if anybody had gotten the idea out of that, that Christianity was to be set aside and not encouraged in our country, or if it was to be put on the same platform and, and, and le on a level playing field with all these other religions, you know, not only would the rank and file, the bulk of American population disapproved of such a thing, they would have been up in arms and angry that anybody would get such an idea and try to promote it in our country. Look how far we have fallen from our moorings, from our original platform on which our nation was built. Joseph's story had many other wonderful things to say that give us a proper perspective. Now, once again, you say, well, why should we listen to him? Who's he? Well, he's a father of American jurisprudence. He wrote the first set of commentaries on the Constitution. He knew what he was talking about. He understood the historical setting of these discussions. Look at paragraph 1870. But the duty of supporting religion, and especially the Christian religion, is very different from the right to force the consciences of other men or to punish them for worshiping God in the manner which they believe their accountability to Him, that is to God, requires. It has been truly said that religion or the duty we owe to our Creator in the manner of discharging it can be dictated only by reason and conviction, not by force or violence. He's quoting there 
the Virginia Bill of Rights. Mr. Locke himself, who did not doubt the right of government to interfere in matters of religion and especially to encourage Christianity, at the same time was, has expressed his opinion of the right of private judgment and liberty of conscience in a manner becoming his character as a sincere friend of civil and religious liberty. Here's the quotation that uh, Joseph Story takes from uh, John Locke. No man or society of men have any authority to impose their opinions or interpretations on any other. The meanest Christian, meanest of course at that time meant the most average or common Christian, since in matters of religion, every man must know and believe and give an account for himself. Now, story continues. The rights of conscience are indeed beyond the just reach of any human power. They're given by God and cannot be encroached upon by human authority without a criminal disobedience of the precepts of natural as well as of revealed religion. Revealed religion, of course, is a reference to the Bible, Scripture. Now notice carefully how he nails this down in paragraph 1871. The real object of the amendment, that is the First Amendment, was not to countenance much less to advance Mohammedanism, that's Islam, or Judaism, or infidelity by prostrating Christianity? Absolutely not. Well, what was the purpose of the First Amendment? To exclude all rivalry among Christian sects and to prevent any national ecclesiastical establishment which should give to an hierarchy the exclusive patronage of the national government. Well, that's pretty much self-explanatory. That's exactly what the First Amendment meant. And then notice, turning the page or two, he says in some of the states, now notice, here's the religious complexion of America at the beginning. In some of the states, Episcopalians constituted the predominant sect. In others, Presbyterians. In others, Congregationalists. In others, Quakers. In others, again, there was a close numerical rivalry among contending sects. It was impossible that there should not arise perpetual strife and perpetual jealousy on the subject of ecclesiastical ascendancy, that is, the role of uh, religion asserting itself over the state. Notice, if the national government were left free to create a religious establishment, the only security was in extirpating the power. What did he mean? He meant we need an amendment that says the government is not to set up one, one Christian sect as the state religion. This alone would have been an imperfect security if it had not been followed up by a declaration of the right of the free exercise of religion and a prohibition, as we've seen, of all religious tests. Thus, the whole power over the subject of religion is left, look at this, exclusively to the state governments. Now, that is zeroing in on the point that both Jefferson and all of these other founders made. When they wrote the First Amendment, freedom of religion, the government's not to interfere with that, it's not to set up a state religion. At the same time, those founders were saying, however, on the state level, you know, your respective states, the state government can do that. If the state of Massachusetts or the state of South Carolina wanted to set up one particular denominational sect, the federal government should not interfere with that. The states had a right to do that. And so here were these founders stressing this fact that the federal government is not to be allowed to say or do anything that would interfere with the free exercise of the Christian religion. But folks, that's exactly what the federal government has been doing now for several decades. Interfering with and trying to cleanse out of our civilization allusions to God, Christ, and the Bible. When the U.S. Supreme Court in the 1960s banned the Bible and banned prayer to the one true God from our public schools. They not only were going against the will of the God of the universe and in that sense committing a grievous sin, but what's more, they were going against the very individuals that wrote the First Amendment that served on, in the first U.S. Supreme Courts. They literally betrayed their trust as justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. Let me call your attention to one other quotation from Joseph Story. This from his, um, again, monumental work known as a familiar exposition of the Constitution 
of the United States. This one was published in 1840. Look carefully at this, paragraph 441, talking again about the First Amendment. The same policy which introduced into the Constitution the prohibition of any religious test led to this more extended prohibition of the interference of Congress in religious concerns. We are Now listen to this. This is so critical. We are not to attribute this prohibition of a national religious establishment to an indifference to religion in general and especially to Christianity, which none could hold in more reverence than the framers of the Constitution. He has there just denied the general flow, gist, and thrust of current jurisprudence. But to a dread by the people of the influence of ecclesiastical power in matters of government. Think about all the occasions where that has occurred in human history. Look at all of the countries in history where, where a religion gets a hold of the federal government and controls the government and then begins to use the power of the federal government to inflict punishment and death upon all those who disagree with them on religious doctrine. You see, the Founders' own forefathers went through that. That's why the Pilgrims fled from their native country. Because the federal government or the, the king or the queen was interfering with their right to pursue Christianity as they wanted. Here is Joseph's story, nailing this down for us, articulating clearly the purpose and function of the First Amendment. Let us keep uh, reading to get uh, the rest of his insightful remarks on this. A dread which their ancestors brought with them from the parent country, and which unhappily for human infirmity, their own conduct after their immigration had not in any just degree tended to, to diminish. There was religious persecution in, in this country before the founding, even by those who descended from the pilgrims. It was also obvious from the numerous and powerful sects existing in the United States that there would be perpetual temptations to struggles for ascendancy to the national councils if anyone might thereby hope to found a permanent and exclusive national government or establishment of its own. And religious persecutions might thus be introduced to an, utter, uh, to an extent utterly subversive of the true interests and good order of the republic the most effectual mode of suppressing the evil in the view of the people was to strike down the temptations to its introduction. Once again, all he's saying is, that's the purpose of the First Amendment, to prevent a national establishment of one religion. Now, before we leave him, notice in paragraph 442 that he stresses that that's not to say that religion must not in any way be involved in the government. It must be. And notice as you proceed down in that paragraph, he says the promulgation of the great doctrines of religion. And look at this listing here of these that he says are absolutely essential to any civilization, but especially the American Republic. Here are these great doctrines of religion. The being and attributes and providence of one almighty God. That's the God of the Bible. The responsibility to Him for all our actions founded upon moral accountability. Number three, a future state of rewards and punishments. That's Christianity, heaven and hell. Number four, the cultivation of all the personal, social, and benevolent virtues. He's talking about Christian morality, not lying, not stealing, not murdering. He says these never can be a matter of indifference in any well-ordered community. It is indeed difficult to conceive how any civilized society can well exist without them. And at all events, it is impossible for those who believe in the truth of Christianity as a divine revelation to doubt that it is the especial duty of government to foster and encourage it among all the citizens and subjects. This is a point wholly distinct from that of the right of private judgment in matters of religion and of the freedom of public worship according to the dictates of one's conscience. This is, uh, this is incredible stuff. This is absolutely amazing. He, he's, he's made it so succinct and so clear. Now here would be a good application of what he just said. In this country, if the founders wanted Christianity in the general sense, the great doctrines of Christianity, one God, heaven and hell, the Bible's the word of God, 
If we want that in, generally encouraged and spread throughout our society, so our, we'll have a great country. Well, that includes, of course, going to church on Sunday. That, that's a fundamental doctrine of New Testament Christianity. You, you need to worship God on Sunday. All right, so should we go around and force people to go to church on Sunday? Here's what the founders would say. No. No. Uh, should they go to church on Sunday? Oh, pff, absolutely. In fact, if, if too many of our people quit going to church, our country's going down the tubes. They'll become irreligious, uh, greedy, focused on just uh, fanning the flesh and doing all the things that people do these days, even on Sunday. But we're not going to compel anybody to go to church on Sunday because we got freedom of religion. The government's not to interfere with that. However, from the very beginning of our country, right up until at least the 1950s and 60s, our country always had an effect on all levels of government, what they called blue laws. Blue laws were there for the purpose of discouraging any form of regular business taking place on Sunday. Notice that. We're going to make you go to church on Sunday? No. But are we going to make a law that says nobody is to open their business on Sunday and conduct regular business? Yeah, we'll make that law. That's not an infringement upon your religion. Nobody's forced, dragging you into the church building trying to make you be religious. But we're not going to accommodate your unbelief. We're not going to encourage your irreligion. Because our civilization is based upon Christianity and it depends upon moral Christian people in order for it to be perpetuated. We won't mistreat anyone for refusing to embrace what they call true religion. But neither are we going to arrange our society to encourage or to promote irreligion or, for that matter, false religion. Why? Why, why would the founders and the bulk of Americans from the beginning of our history, why were they like that? Were they a bunch of religious nuts, a bunch of wackos, right-wing radicals? That's what they're called today in our country. Good, average, balanced people all over our country are being called radical and right-wing and all of that stuff. That's ridiculous. These are the moral uh, foundation of our civilization. And so were the founders and most Americans thereafter. Why? Why were they that way? So that they wanted to discourage uh, people missing church and so forth. Answer to that? They knew that the republic depends on our religious and moral values. Let me take you to another founder. Also, very clearly, a quintessential founder. These are not oddball founders. These are mainstream and extremely prominent in their involvement in the founding of our country, in their participation in it, in their forming, shaping, and fashioning of it. That's the men I'm taking you to. Take, for example, John Quincy Adams. Here was the son of the first vice president and the second president, John Adams. This was their, their oldest boy. And he began his governmental career in his teens. He was appointed to uh, be our ambassador, minister they called him, to Portugal. He then served as ambassador to the Netherlands, then to Prussia. He then went into the U.S. Senate. Then he went and served as our ambassador to Russia and followed that up with being our ambassador to Britain. He uh, was appointed to the Secretary of State under uh, President James Monroe. Then he served in the U.S. House. Then he became our sixth president. And then after that, he went back into the House. The only president to ever step down from the presidency and go back into the U.S. House. And by the way, he was the vice president of the American Bible Society for many years, about 30 years. A quintessential founding father. Do you know, he delivered a speech which was so common for many, many years after the founding of our country. The, the local uh, community would gather together. They would bring in a prominent personality and he would deliver a speech on the 4th of July. 4th of July in our country has dissipated significantly. It's now more of a time, you know, for a few fireworks and eating together, but really bringing people back to the original purpose of a 4th of July celebration seems to be swiftly evaporating. Look at this tremendous speech that he delivered. He was invited to come and to speak uh, to the local community on the 4th of July. It was 1821. Uh, this was actually in what today is called D.C., and look at this statement that he made in that uh, particular speech. From the day of the declaration, the people of the North American Union and of its constituent states 
were associated bodies of civilized men and Christians in a state of nature, but not of anarchy. Nature, natural law, it's a, it's a big buzz concept in their day. They were, now notice, these are the founders he's referring to. They were bound by the laws of God, which they all, and by the laws of the gospel, that is Christianity, which they nearly all, acknowledged as the rules of their conduct. Now there is a founder, a quintessential founder, telling us how it was at the beginning. Now let me take you about, what, 20 some years into the future, not quite 20, where he delivers another 4th of July speech. This is 61 years after 1776. And look at what he said on this occasion. The Declaration of Independence cast off all the shackles of this dependency. He's talking about British dependency. The United States of America were no longer colonies. They were an independent nation of Christians. Now, are you going to believe the ACLU, Americans United for Separation of Church and State, Freedom from Religion, found a host of other organizations when they tell you that the founders of our country were a bunch of deists and atheists, they were not Christian, they were not religious, and they didn't want religion and Christianity into the government or into the American way of life. Who are you going to believe? I mean, here's a man who was there. He was taken by his father under his arm and walked through the founding of our country. And he himself then lived a distinguished life in the government and in politics, intimately acquainted with the founding of our country. And he said there wasn't an atheist among them. They all believed in God and His laws, and almost all of them believed in Christianity, what he called the gospel. So folks, the founders' idea of religious freedom was sensible and really quite simple. In stark contrast with the self-contradictory and inconsistent view of today's vacuous notions of tolerance and political correctness. The facts show that the mass of the founders, with few exceptions, believed that the Christian worldview and Christian principles, especially Christian morality, must be the foundation of the republic. I challenge you to get a hold of the DVD, America's Most Pressing Concern, that takes you through the proclamations of the Continental Congress from 1775 to 1783 that proves this beyond any doubt. So you see, their view of religious freedom and tolerance amounted essentially to the prevention of religious persecution. Those who practiced no religion or a non-Christian religion could come to our country. They would not be persecuted. Why? Well, because the bulk of the founders and the mass of American citizens embraced Christian principles that forbid persecuting one's fellow man. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 38 and following, and Luke chapter 6, 27 and following. So the founders believed that. They, they themselves had felt the sting of persecution whenever they disagreed with the state religion under which they all lived their lives before the Declaration, the Church of England. They were well familiar with their mother country's long history of religious oppression, depending upon whether a Catholic was on the throne of England or a Protestant monarch was on the throne. So the founders' forefathers, the pilgrims, fled England because of this religious persecution. And it was, it was deadly. And so the founders and the framers, they wanted this new republic to dispense with such coercion, which is in complete harmony with the nature of God Himself and the principles of Christianity. You know, God created humans to possess a free will. And therefore, they're called upon by God to make their own decisions. God's not going to coerce anybody. They've got to decide where they want to spend their eternal destiny. And if God is that way, the government ought to be that way. Notice that because the founders had grown up in an environment that promulgated Christian principles, they understood and embraced Jesus' admonition that we ought to treat others the way we want to be treated, Matthew 7:12. So to the founders permitting non-Christian peoples to live in our country without persecution, they were willing for that to happen. But they were not celebrating diversity. They were not endorsing 
or trying to give any sort of encouragement to what they themselves considered to be false religion. What they were doing was simply, first and foremost, an affirmation of their desire that all people be allowed to pursue happiness without governmental intrusion or coercion. But let me hasten to add two critical exceptions to their view of the freedom of religion and the involvement of religion even in government. Number one, religious toleration extended only so far as the religion in question did not engage in a practice that is deemed by Christian standards to be immoral. For example, there was a case early on, just shortly after the founding, 1815, Commonwealth versus uh, Sharpless. Uh, the defendant was convicted because he was displaying in his home an obscene painting of a man and a woman. And uh, that was considered to be, obviously, an offense against Christian morality. And so he was prosecuted appropriately. Uh, do you remember in the uh, late 1800s, there were a number of U.S. Supreme Court cases where Mormon polygamy was being prosecuted as violations of Christian morality in the territories of Utah and Idaho. Uh, the defense attorneys argued, well, wait a minute, this is a free country and this is, well, we have the First Amendment, we've got freedom of religion, and this is part of our religion. Uh, look at some of these cases, Reynolds versus United States, 1879, uh, Murphy v. Ramsey, 1885, Davis v. Uh, Beeson, 1890. None of the courts fell for that line of reasoning. They understood that this is a misunderstanding of uh, what we mean by freedom of religion. Freedom of religion doesn't allow you to do anything just because you say it's your religion. If it is deemed by Christian standards to be immoral or licentious, that's harmful to our civilization. Notice as Islam is making significant encroachments into American society. It has a brazen advocacy of polygamy in Surah chapter 4, Surah 4. Well, the founders would have jumped on that quick. We can't let that go on in our country. You'll undermine our, our very civilization. You'll erode our Christian morality. But here we are. Most Americans apparently don't have any problem with that. Well, that's their religion. You know, we need to celebrate diversity and we need to allow them the same consideration. That appalling ignorance, not only of what the Bible teaches, but of the founding principles in our population that inevitably sanctions that kind of immorality under the guise of tolerance and religious freedom, that is going to undermine the foundations of our civilization. It already is. Exception number two, which helps us to clarify the notion of religious freedom. The founders insisted that religious freedom does not allow you to engage in any action that would bring physical harm to self or other citizens. You know, actions like, uh, I remember back in the 60s, a Buddhist priest setting himself on fire in the street. Uh, temple priestesses uh, providing uh, sexual services to worshipers and devotees. Brothels, uh, uh, these businesses all over our country now that peddle pornography even on the internet. Folks, I'm telling you, these would not have been tolerated by the founders under the guise of freedom of religion and First Amendment free speech. Absolutely not. Go look at the 1859 case, Commonwealth versus Nesbitt. Approving that kind of thing is a natural byproduct. It's inevitable that you would go down that road once you embrace political correctness. But that is a misunderstanding of the principle of religious freedom and it amounts to the loss of the average American's commitment to Christian morality. Religious freedom notwithstanding, the founders were wary of any infiltration of our nation's institutions by any religion or people who manifested inclinations toward physical violence or some other form of immorality. This sanitized version of America's history confuses religious tolerance by the founders with endorsement, promotion, accommodation, and therefore it fails to discern the distinction made by the founders between religious tolerance on the one hand and their firm belief in the priority of the Christian religion on the other. Let me repeat, it is imperative 
that the discussion of religious freedom in America in the 21st century be framed and shaped by the Founders' own insistence that one, all non-Christian religions are to be tolerated as long as they don't advocate uh, violence or immorality, and number two, the existence of the Republic and all the features of the American way of life that are the envy of the world. These depend on a majority of Americans maintaining their belief in and practice of the general principles of the Christian religion. Let me take you to one more founder before we close. Noah Webster. So far as I know, he never signed any document, not a signer of the Constitution, Declaration. He graduated from Yale in 1778. He left uh, Yale twice in the midst of his studies in order to go involve himself in Revolutionary War battles. He uh, printed a pamphlet that urged ratification of the Constitution, kind of got the ball rolling on that. He, he and uh, Benjamin Franklin worked for a number of months together uh, on the English language, specifically American English, trying to standardize American English as opposed to uh, British English. Uh, he served in the uh, Massachusetts legislature. He ended up authoring, of course, the American Dictionary of the English Language. He's the dictionary man in America. Uh, he even helped found a college, Amherst College. He's gone down in history as the father of American scholarship and education. He easily qualifies, along with these other men I've called your attention to, as a quintessential founding father. Go online. Go to Google Books and get a look at a copy of his history of the United States and look at these incredible comments. Our citizens should early understand that the genuine source of correct Republican principles is the Bible, particularly the New Testament or the Christian religion. The religion which has introduced civil liberty is the religion of Christ and His apostles, which enjoins humility, piety, and benevolence which acknowledged in every person a brother or a sister and a citizen with equal rights. This is genuine Christianity, and to this we owe our free constitutions of government. He also said, The Christian religion ought to be received and maintained with firm and cordial support. It is the real source of all genuine Republican principles. The religion of Christ and His apostles in its primitive simplicity and purity, unencumbered with the trappings of power and the pomp of ceremonies, is the surest basis of a republican government. Those who destroy the influence and authority of the Christian religion, is that happening in our country today, even among politicians? You know what those people are doing according to this prominent founder? They're sapping the foundations of public order, of liberty, and of Republican government. Another quotation from Noah Webster, the United States commenced their existence under circumstances wholly novel and unexampled in the history of nations. They commenced with, look at this listing, civilization, with learning, with science, with constitutions of free government, and with that best gift of God to man, the Christian religion. Folks, that's what we need in our country. That's the only way to, to cause our country to survive. We need to maintain the Christian religion. You know, under the law of Moses, here God gave a law to the Israelites, the Jewish people. And notice how He combined church and state. It was a civil law code designed to regulate human behavior in the context of a nation, national life but it also was uh, riddled with uh, religious requirements. Under Christianity, God has separated the two. The government is a separate entity from the church. Well, the founding fathers of our country agreed with that idea. Separation of church and state to them meant that one Protestant church was not to become the state religion, but they believed Christianity to be the true religion and so they sought to incorporate, to include Christian principles into the establishment of this new nation's civil institutions. Folks, the bottom line is our liberty, our freedom, 
our future survival depends on Christian morality and the approval of God. To the extent that our nation expels God, to the extent that we shove the Bible out of public life and stop teaching young people all over our country what the Bible teaches, as we jettison Christian principles from public life, to that extent, we will degenerate into civil disorder. We will ultimately lose our freedoms and even worse, we will earn the disfavor of Almighty God. Let us do all we can to encourage our fellow citizens to turn back to God and back to His inspired Word before He withdraws the gracious favor He has bestowed on our country. Proverbs 14.34, Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. For additional materials by Apologetics Press pertaining to America's spiritual heritage, contact Apologetics Press, phone number 800-234-8558, or visit us online at apologeticspress.org.